Hey, everybody. Welcome to the AVA Labs and AWS subnet session and demo. My name is Gabriel Cardona. I am a developer evangelist from AVA Labs. And recently, AVA Labs and Amazon Web Services, or AWS, have joined forces to accelerate, accelerate enterprise, institutional, and government adoption of blockchain. AWS supports Avalanche's infrastructure and DAP ecosystem, including one-click node deployment through the AWS marketplace. Critically, Avalanche node operators can run in AWS GovCloud for FedRAMP compliance use cases. This is a vital capability and a prerequisite for enterprises and governments. Ava Labs is also a member of the AWS Partner Network, enabling the firm to help customers deploy custom offerings on AWS that are connected to more than 100,000 partners across more than 150 countries. And today we wanted to bring together the AWS Web3 and Avalanche engineering teams to dig into the inspiration behind the partnership and highlight some of the potential unlocked by this partnership. And today I am joined from Ava Labs by Patrick O'Grady, the head of engineering. Hello, Patrick, thank you for joining us. Also, I'm yeah, joined by you. you. Thank you. I'm also uh, joined by Gyuho Lee, who is the platform staff software engineer. Hello, Gyuho. Hello. Hello. And from Amazon or AWS, I am joined by Shai Perednik, who is the global tech lead Web3 at AWS. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. We have several different questions where we wanted to dig into the a uh, recently announced partnership between uh, Ava Labs and AWS. So to kick us off, I'm going to ask Shai, why did AWS choose Avalanche? Yeah, thank you for that question. So it's really about why do the builders on AWS are choosing Avalan Ava Labs and Avalanche? Right? And I think that's really the, the question I want to focus on. So really with, with builders, what we heard consistently throughout the last year and a half uh, was a, an ask really for Avalanche, right? We, we, we talked to a lot of builders, we talked to a lot of partners in this space, and that was something that we constantly heard throughout many conversations was an interest in deploying on the Avalanche network, an interest in the Avalanche subnets, um, really digging into the technology itself and really highlighting uh, the value of the quick finality of the Avalanche subnet, as well as the multi-chain architecture uh, of the actual uh, Avalanche net itself. And then plus really excited at the subnets and the opportunities in subnets. And so one thing we do at AWS and Amazon is we really listen to our customers. And that's really what we focused on. We build backwards from our customers. So next, I wanted to bounce the ball to Patrick and say, what are the benefits of coupling Avalanche infrastructure into AWS? Yeah, so I mean, um, if you've... <laughs> If you've listened to anything about Avalanche that we've done recently, or even in this talk, a lot of the conversations about subnets, right? And um, one of the big things that is most exciting about subnets is the flexibility for the custom virtual machine architecture uh, that you can employ as a subnet developer. Um, and I think so far, most people that have experimented with subnets have relied on uh, the subnet EVM to actually launch their own subnet. So they want to you know, have Solidity smart contracting, generally just using the EVM to launch their own blockchain. Uh, but over the next you know, few months and, and years, we really expect the uh, you know, scope of the exploration uh, on different types of virtual machines to grow quite dramatically, uh, to use all sorts of different types of compute, either like dramatically more compute for high performance custom virtual machines or coupling together all sorts of different services. Uh, to make the virtual machines much more interesting, whether that be like embedding archival support using traditional databases uh, or like like offloading some of the uh, typical like node uh, app, uh, node interactions to different sorts of services. And so AWS, as many people have come to know and love, has a very wide category or large category of different uh, services and uh, tools that can be employed into virtual machine building and everything like that. And so uh, for really pushing subnets forward, AWS is a great partner because of uh, everything you can connect to as a subnet builder, um, alone, uh, aside from just helping to spin up subnets in general. Okay, excellent. 
And now, Gyuho, what are the steps required for setting up an Avalanche node on AWS? Yeah, I think uh, Shai and Patrick covered pretty well why we and many operators choose AWS for the node infra and then thumbnail infrastructure. And then my favorite part of AWS is it is providing all the foundational layers for the builders. There's a joke saying that AWS has like a 10 different ways to run containers, which I think is awesome for someone like me, like who wants to customize and then control low level like infrastructure. And this is the same for the Avalanche node setup. Like there are many ways to run node on AWS. And the easiest way to set up a node today is the one-click node deployment in the marketplace, which we recently announced. By the way, the credit goes to our infra team and then AWS team. And then this marketplace integration is great because now our labs always maintains and publishes the latest versions of software in Amazon machine image format, or we call AMI, so AMI. So, so when you spin up a node, like you do not have to worry about installing the latest like Avalanche Go, like a software, and you do not have to worry about making sure that the underlying OS has all the security patches in. And like our labs and the AWS team will take care of that. So now you can start using these armies with your choice of compute or any EC2 instances. And then another great thing about this, the, now you can spin up Avalanche node in any AWS data center, like in the world. I know AWS has many like uh, regions, like availability zones, and they even the special regions like GovCloud or Outpost in the edge location. Like having Avalanche armies available in the marketplace, like unlocks like all of that. And then, and uh, that's pretty much like all you need, like for the first day, and then army and the EC2 instance and the EBS volume for the data. Okay, perfect. And um, to everybody out there watching, if we have um, documentation at docs.avox.network showing how to spin up a node using the one click deployment from the AWS marketplace, there is both um, like a text tutorial. And then there's an accompanying video, which we recorded. And then if you stay tuned to the end of this presentation, we're also going to do another demo showing how to spin up a node using the AWS one-click deployment, and then show how to also launch a subnet using the Avalanche CLI tool in concert with a Ledger hardware wallet. So at the end of this, there will be actually a demo showing you how to do that, or you can check out our docs. So that is um, how to spin up an Avalanche node on AWS. Now, Patrick, we're wondering what steps are required to keep the nodes running beyond just the initial bootstrapping of the node? Yeah, I mean, so getting day one and getting started is obviously, uh, you know, the one huge first step. After that, you'll want to do a few different things. Uh, first of all, probably start up, uh, you know, start running the subnet. Um, and so with that, you know, you have to be able to uh, basically add support to the node to start syncing the subnet. Um, so that's one one thing that most people commonly do. And so there, as Gabriel mentioned, there's a number of docs dedicated to this. And at the end of the session, he'll walk through exactly how that's done. So feel free to refer back to that. Um, the other one that's really important, and um, I think that we're working on uh, some documentation now for, is actually uh, how to ingest the metrics uh, from the node into uh, AWS's monitoring tooling. Now, this is really important for keeping the nodes running uh, because you know, as you run different services, it's obviously like monitoring them and alerting on them when things are not going as expected is a critical part of maintaining a high level of uh, you know, performance and reliability. Um, and so monitoring them for any sort of anomaly, if there's something wrong with your setup or something wrong with the networking in your host or something like that uh, can be really useful to make sure that uh, your node is actually running reliably. Uh, and then lastly, um, Avalabs puts out uh, a, a typically a new point release for Avalanche Go every two to three weeks with different performance uh, upgrades, uh, as well as new features on the network. Uh, so it's important to also update your node periodically to make sure you don't uh, fall behind uh, if there's a network upgrade or something like that. Uh, and so over time, you know, we've reduced the uh, basically the compute usage and CPU and RAM and everything like that uh, substantially since the since the launch of the network. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I think, um, uh, what that allows you to do over time is like continue to lower the compute that you require to pay on different cloud providers and everything like that, uh, or to run more throughput uh, at the same level of cloud, uh, cloud compute say. So, yep. I think, uh, you know, I, I take those three things and, uh, you know, we'll, we continue to try to make it as easy as possible with AWS to, to manage that without much uh, interaction such that for most people, uh, you know, it's really just a standard API that can interact with just like any other web service they may use. Okay, excellent. And so now this is a question I wanted to split between Patrick and Shai. We'll go with Shai first. So, um, what is the most important piece of the Avalanche and AWS partnership? So for me, I'm, I'm really excited because my background has been a lot in, in really storage and compute and networking and really the foundational infrastructure that, that really even came before blockchain is really a foundational piece of it. So nodes are really that foundational piece. Um, and that's where I get particularly excited because we're talking about really accelerating not just builders like myself that are, that are writing in code and deploying our own smart contracts, uh, but we're talking about the fundamental like builders in this space as well that are building tools for people like me. Um, and that's really, really I get to enjoy every day as part of my role is I get to talk to a lot of those partners out there that are building a lot of those really cool um, developer tooling uh, APIs or SDKs or, um, you know, no, no code or low code solutions. And I, I'm so excited because. I hear the excitement from them about how much it's going to accelerate them and how much they can focus really on the, the product and the solution itself now, as opposed to really having to focus on managing the underlying node and how to deploy it and all the underlying overhead that, that comes along with uh, managing a node. So I, I'm really excited at that really uh, systematic impact at the foundational level. And particularly, remember, there's also a lot of partners for node access um, that, that you can go to, uh, to to get access to an Avalanche node that are built on top of AWS as well. And so it's not just only directly through the AWS marketplace, but it's also going to accelerate those uh, partners that are building on top of AWS as well. So I'm, I'm just super excited. that I'm, I'm really glad that we're really digging in deep here because I think it's going to have a really a long uh, lasting impact on really the whole developing ecosystem overall. Um, I'll hand it over to Patrick with that. Yeah, I think I think for us, it's, uh, you know, AWS clearly knows how to drive value uh, for different companies and enterprises building really cool things uh, in the 21st century. Um, and so uh, for um, for us, like one huge, uh, you know, really huge part of the partnership for us is learning how we how Avalanche, how like subnets in general uh, can be most valuable and useful to people. Um, and so partnering with AWS allows us to get access to all of their customers and what they're interested in doing, uh, as well as to learn what it takes uh, for them to view Avalanche as a reliable thing. So like, what does the node need to do? How, what does it have to be to, to be reliable as people expect it to be? Um, so one is, you know, one just big piece of it is learning. The second is, is uh, you know, I think getting started. So Avalanche right now, like we've talked about this one click deploy that lets you spin up a node pretty easily. Uh, but uh, AWS has tons of, you know, different products and platforms and things like that, where it may make sense eventually to connect to Avalanche in some interesting ways. Um, and so opening the door to that conversation uh, and then uh, really understanding what their customers would like to see uh, after starting to get starting to use Avalanche is going to be really critical product feedback for how we choose to develop uh, or like contribute to the development of Avalanche go, going forward. Okay, great. And Shai, what is the most important piece of the Avalanche and AWS partnership? So I, I think the, the part that I'm really excited about for our customers is really the ability to go in through the marketplace and really through the AWS partner network, um, because that's that makes it much easier for customers to uh, consume the Avalanche nodes as well, consume the other AWS services and other things that we're going to be looking to build uh, with Avalanche as well, right? And so when we're talking about really the the, the part that's exciting is really the deeper uh, technical relationship and partnership that we're looking to build, which is really about accelerating developers. I, and and I, 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 I'm so excited about that part. So I, I know we're going to get to that a bit later, so I don't want to cut that off. And so Patrick, how will AWS and Avalanche accelerate developer adoption of Web3? 
Yeah. So, I mean, um, one huge, you know, piece of Web3, I think like one one huge thing that people want to uh, see to accelerate the developer adoption of Web3 is just to make everything easier to use and more reliable out of the box. And so by relying on like the awesome technical team uh, at AWS to find different ways to, to run Avalanche nodes uh, reliably and easily on AWS, uh, it can make blockchain just generally easier and uh, more reliable to use out of the box. Um, you know, outside of the table stakes of what that means, um, there's also a lot of room for technical collaboration to build different types of cloud tooling and different types of tooling in general to make nodes more efficient and reliable using uh, homegrown or uh, proprietary solutions uh, on AWS to make nodes even faster or to increase the throughput uh, of different subnets using new types of hardware or software uh, solutions. Um, and so I think it starts with ease of use, uh, relying on existing tooling to make it easier to orchestrate nodes, create subnets, uh, but then also to start to push the envelope uh, with more advanced solutions using, uh, you know, interesting R&D uh, of different cloud providers like AWS. And Shai, would you like yeah. to add on to that? Yeah. Yeah, I want to I want to jump yeah, in there, wanted, on the developer solutions, right? When we talk about like serverless solutions, or really that that bring that Web two experience really to the Web three world, because as builders and developers, right, that's really what we're expecting, right? We we have this expectation of what the Web two build build experience is like, right? Serverless tools, uh, Lambda functions within AWS and Step functions, all this way to orchestrate databases that we no longer have to manage the underlying infrastructure, right? So all this the Web two experience that we're expecting in the Web three world. And that, to me, is really the, the exciting part here because that's really what we're accelerating, right? By making that foundational infrastructure easier to use and easier to manage and maintain and all those things, it allows all those partners and builders out there building that tooling stack and that developer stack that's so important to really focus on making the best tooling out there that they possibly can, right? So looking at what does it take to make a, a decentralized version of, it, of a certain application and, and a f decentralizing the front end, decentralizing the storage layer, decentralizing all the different layers of the application. So I think that's what's really exciting is by making different parts of that, of, of that stack easier to deploy and quicker to deploy, it allows us as builders to focus on the other areas. And, and that's where we need to really focus on and continue to innovate in this space. Okay, great. And Patrick, what does the future roadmap look like? Yeah, so I mean, um, over the next few months, uh, we're going to start releasing a number of uh, new SDKs that make it easier to build new and uh, powerful virtual machines on top of Avalanche outside of the EVM. Um, and through that process, uh, we think that we'll see an explosion of creativity uh, and interesting activity on Avalanche on top of you know what what people are already seeing. Um, and so coupled that with what we released a few weeks ago with the ability for subnets to actually send messages to each other now using something called Avalanche Warp Messaging, uh, you know, a lot of our future roadmap uh, includes this notion of like a really interesting and diverse subnet ecosystem running all sorts of different virtual machines, but having the ability to quickly and efficiently communicate with each other. Uh, with that as the table uh, kind of stakes, a, a lot of the resourcing and roadmapping uh, or really the engineering resources will go into uh, continuing to make these virtual machines higher and higher performance. Uh, you know, I think over the next year, you know, we could we would hope to see like a lot of the throughput on subnets increase 100,000 X, right? Because it's horizontally scalable. Uh, there is no central bottleneck that we're going to see used. And a lot of the virtual machines and subnets that people will run uh, will be running um, all over the place. AWS, uh, you know, will be one big part of that. Uh, so whether if you're an enterprise, like a gaming company uh, or uh, a government institution and you want to be able to run your own blockchain for whatever your use case is, um, you know, the goal is to really make that as easy and as powerful as possible uh, out of the box so that, uh, you know, you can build on top of blockchain and not necessarily worry about as much as building uh, the blockchain. And so uh, we're trying to provide as many tooling and opportunities to, to build on that as possible. Okay, excellent. And Yuho, can you talk about the parallel deployment tool which you've been working on for anyone to use that makes deep use of AWS? Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been working on this tool called Avalanche Ops. So I wanted the test network on AWS where I can do whatever I want. 
So things like injecting network failures and then sending DDoS-like transactions for load testing. So for this kind of testing on isolated network with actual physical machines can better simulate the production system in the long term. So yeah, yes, you can use Fuji public testnet for this, but having an isolated network can give you more freedom and uh, faster iteration, like for those types of like end-to-end -end testing. So the goals are like I want it to have a like a single command to create a custom and test network on AWS, and then also clean up like those resources after the test is done, and then I want it to use the same command to run like a deploy the node on Fuji and the mainnet node in the most like cost efficient way. And then it's all built in like Rust because AWS happens to provide the best SDK for all the things that we need it. And then also comes with a bunch of plugins like to make the AWS setup like more predictable and more cost efficient. So for instance, like when the node comes up, it creates and it attaches the, the EBS volume and then also support like a spot instance like a for like cost savings like on the and then like on the instance restart you can also retain the data volume and then like putting it back to the instance so you don't have to wait another few days to sync with the network and then like you can also set up the like a thumbnail from scratch like with a like a single comment and no, but I can stop here. But like one may argue that like you can do all this in Kubernetes, like which is true. But using this self-contained like a setup without like external control plane can be way cheaper than like relying on Kubernetes. Like which I think is important if you want to decentralize the network by making the node operation like a more like affordable. So yeah, check it out. Like it's called Avalanche Ops. Very cool. And so, Shai, what are the current Web3 infrastructure challenges and how will AWS address them? Yeah, so I, I think some of the, the technical challenges that we're seeing is we're hearing really from our customers is really around chain indexing is being a big challenge, right? How do you index all the chain data? How do you make sense of that data? How do you manage state data? Um, how do you manage the underlying node that's part of that that infrastructure, right? And so this is this is a key way that we're addressing that is by listening to our customers and then building things like the marketplace, the avalanche ops that Yuho was talking about, um, building subnet examples as well, right? So that you can deploy not only a subnet, but a subnet for GameFi or a subnet for TradFi or a subnet for any other public sector type of use case. That's what our customers are asking for. And that's really what we do really well is we listen to our customers. And so we're going to continue working backwards in the customer and really focus on those specific use case examples, because that's really where they need help in. They're really struggling in figuring out where to start. And when you're able to present an example of, you know, here's how to deploy a subnet for a game example, and you show not only the node deployment and the subnet deployment, the cross-chain messaging, and you show the developer tooling as part of that, as well as the sort of all the other pieces that you need to build the front end as well, it makes it much easier for the developer to come in and start building. And that's really what we need to do, right? We need to lower the, we need to, we need to raise the quality bar, right? We need to make it, but we need to lower the, we need to make it easier for developers to get in, right? And that's what we're going to continue to focus on is listening to our, our builders out there, listening to our customers, and we'll continue building, building with our partners to, to answer those questions and challenges. Wonderful. And Patrick, what holds most companies back from adopting blockchain technology today? Yeah, I think I could spend probably a few hours uh, talking about this one. But uh, generally, uh, I think of it as two two things. Um, and I think those two things explain the rise of uh, EVM and Solidity, which is uh, most companies, when they want to launch some new feature or new technology, they want to make sure they really fully understand what they're doing before they jump into it. Uh, and so from a technology perspective, usually that comes down to tooling and access to developers. Uh, because blockchain is so new and so diverse, there isn't like a huge set of really powerful and reliable tooling people can use to interact with blockchain technology. And at the same time, uh, it's really difficult and expensive to find uh, developers that can actually assist you with what you're doing. Uh, you know, like I think different surveys have found that like tens of thousands of developers maybe that do like uh, application development on blockchains. Um, and so uh, I think 
for many of them, it's it's really just a hard pill to swallow because they they feel like they're out of control and they feel like if they're going to go commit to something, it just takes a lot of resources. Um, so working with AWS and uh, what they can do to support blockchain is really help to handle most of the, a lot of the tooling questions. So like, hey, like, can we, uh, you know, provide a lot more outside the box? So you don't actually have to do all this tooling work yourself or uh, provide native integrations into things you already know and love about AWS where you would normally have to write some sort of connection or something like that to make it usable. Uh, and then from the developer perspective, that's really where Avalanche saw, uh, shines. Uh, because of the flexibility of the what you can do with virtual machines, uh, you can bring languages that your engineers are already familiar with uh, and approaches to like actually processing transactions that your engineers already know and put them on a blockchain control plane. Uh, and so that can be really useful uh, and powerful for your enterprise because you can just do what you already know and love or what you what you know and is really important to your business, um, but on an entirely different and decentralized kind of backbone. Um, and so right now, I think that's pretty much the, the two things. And, uh, you know, we think that partnerships like this really enable uh, companies to uh, expand into this. And we've already seen this with uh, Deloitte, which, you know, runs uh, an avalanche subnet because of some of these trade-offs. Okay, great. And then our last question going to Shai. How is blockchain technology used today by AWS customers? And what does the future of blockchain look like at AWS? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I, I, I'm excited to, to take this one because really I, I, there's not a day goes by that I don't hear like of another exciting use case from our customers. And, and really those use cases are everyday type of use cases, whether it's a construction ID to enable uh, construction uh, workers to access their tooling much easier in a decentralized way because through verifiable credentials. Or it's a it's a healthcare entity or a, a, a hospital looking to uh, decentralize their documentation or or not simply decentralize but make the access to the documentation uh, decentralized. All these use cases just keep coming up every day because in the end, a lot of our customers are looking at blockchain. They're, they've kind of already moved beyond the stage of cryptocurrencies and digital assets and all those things, and they're really looking at blockchain as a technology and they're understanding that at its core it's really a publicly shareable database, right? And if we, we look at it as a database with a whole bunch of stuff on top of it, it's not that much different from what the technologies that we've used in the past. And so now it's just what kind of other use cases and opportunities can that technology uh, adopt? And so we're seeing a lot of those exciting use cases in enterprise and, and in small, medium business as well as startup, even outside of the Web3 space and very much your traditional legacy enterprise customers that are coming into this space and saying, Okay, I see that there's value here, whether whether it is in the tokenization side of it or it is in the side of the technology side. And they want to really focus on it for data access management, data control, um, all those things in between are, are really the exciting part of the conversation because they're the real world use case is that as users of technology, when we use those solutions, we have no idea that there's actually blockchain tech underneath. Um, and that to me is, is when it's exciting, right? Because it shouldn't be a front, right? Blockchain and this technology that we're building should not be hard to use. So when it's actually hidden under the covers, it means that we're doing something right. So that's the part that excites me. Um, really about the, the future and what that looks like is, is kind of what I said before, really about listening to our customers, listening to our partners and what they're building, what their challenges are, where, where they're struggling, where they're facing, right? We see indexing as, for example, one of the, the biggest uh, questions and comments from our customers um, and our partners are building in this space or are building some awesome stuff for indexing. Right. And, and uh, we'll continue to working with our customers and we'll continue to focus on those builder tools that they need to help accelerate the overall ecosystem. The, the one thing I'll, I'll say is that we keep focusing on really is the, the decentralization as a slider. Right. Think of decentralization as an overall slider. Right. On one end, you have centralization. On one end, you have decentralization. It, we're always as we develop apps, we're going to be somewhere in between. So I think it's important as we build our applications to really think about that slider and really think about how we can build and keep trying to build new apps to push the innovation forward. So I'll wrap up with that. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Do you mind if I add one last thing, Gabriel? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so I mean, in summary for, you know, people watching this clip and understanding, you know, what's Avalanche, why is it, you know, working with AWS, I think uh, the last thing I'll leave people with is, um, the most exciting stuff happens when you can focus on the things that you're best at. Um, and up until now, uh, and even now, uh, people spend so much time in blockchain worrying about things that are just, you know, should be 
it's really the first few steps and really prevent you from getting started, right? Like, how do I hook up this node? How do I run APIs? How do I develop the, you know, smart contracts and make it easy to build really powerful applications? How do I build a front end? How do I index this data to power my front end? Um, you know, how do I run analytics across all this in data formats I've never used before? Um, blockchain will really take a step forward and, you know, really become more and more interesting for the enterprises that use it uh, when they have the opportunity just to worry about the things that they care about. Now, I think AWS revolutionized what that meant for hosting and running technology businesses. Uh, and we think that they'll be able to do it again uh, in the blockchain space. Uh, you know, for people running on AWS, you probably understand you don't have to go to a physical data center, swap out server racks, make sure your hard drives don't die, like, you know, everything like that. Uh, and I think we're still in that phase with blockchain. And so it's really exciting to see large enterprises like AWS uh, you know, take a stab at, at recognizing that, you know, maybe there's something we can do here to make it easier for everyone to use blockchain uh, and then having vision to see what that will enable people to do when, when they can just worry about the things that matter to them. Um, so, yeah, we're really excited to see where this goes and, uh, you know, I think AWS is a great partner to help, help make that happen. Yeah, so very exciting. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time. I just wanted to say to everybody watching, if you want to follow up, you can go check out our tech technical documentation at docs.avox.network. If you want to jump into um, a conversation with the team, you can join us on our Discord server at chat.avox.network. Chat and then if you stick around after this ends, I'm going to give a demo of spinning up a node using the one-click validator from the AWS Marketplace. And then following that, I'm going to show how to launch a subnet on that node using Avalanche, Cli, and a Ledger Hardware Wallet. So again, thank you so much for your time, gentlemen, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Gabriel Cardona, developer evangelist from Ava Labs. And this is a follow-up to yesterday's session where we had Shai from the AWS Web3 team along with um, Yuho and Patrick from the Ava Labs engineering team to talk about the recent Ava Labs and AWS partnership. This is a follow-up to that session where today we are going to be doing a demo showing how to spin up an Avalanche validator node from the one-click um, option that's available in the AWS marketplace. And then after that, I'm going to demo how to launch a subnet onto that recently spun up Avalanche Validator node. And I'll be using Avalanche Cli, which is one of our development tools, as well as a Ledger hardware wallet. So let's go ahead and get started. As you can see here, if you go to the AWS uh, marketplace, we now have this Avalanche Validator node. Um, this is the product overview. You can check out this page and it'll give you uh, information about the pricing and use, usage and supports as well as some reviews. At the top right, you will see a continue to subscribe button. You're going to want to click that. That'll take you to this um, subscription page. You can see I'm already subscribed to this software or else there would be another button for you to click here to subscribe. You can also see there are going to be some terms of service that you may want to check out an end user license agreement and a privacy notice as well as a customer agreement. You can check that out if you like. Next, we want to click continue to configuration. Here, there's nothing we're going to want to change. This is where you have the ability to configure the software. We're going to leave the uh, Amazon machine image as it is. The latest build of Avalanche Go um, is 1.9.5. We're going to leave that the same. And then this is the region that we want to deploy in. So just go ahead and leave everything as it is here and click continue to launch. And then on this page, there's very minor that we're going to want to change. Um, basically, you we want to leave the uh, action to launch from a website. The instance type we're going to keep as a C5 2x large. We're going to keep the VPC settings and the subnet settings. The security group we're going to leave as auto-generated by. Next, there's actually a key pair that we want to choose. And I'm going to drag this off screen for just one brief moment where I, while I choose the key pair because I don't want to reveal any other key pairs which are um, associated with this account. So now you can see that I'm back here. And we have um, chosen the Avalanche key pair. This is a key pair that's local on my machine. Next, we click Launch. 
And okay, so there it is. So this software has been deployed on EC2. Next, we're gonna to wanna to go to the EC2 console and get the IP address of this EC2 instance, which just spun up so that we can SSH into that. And so I'm going to do the same thing, briefly uh, pull this off screen just so I can go to the EC2 console and not reveal any of the other Amazon machine images which are tied to this account. So give me one moment. I'm going to be choosing the key name equals Avalanche and it's gonna bring me up any EC2 instances which have that key pair and here we go, we're back. Thank you very much. Okay, so here we have this um, EC2 instance and this is the box that now has the um, Avalanche full node running at the current moment. You can see it gave us an IP address, which we're going to go ahead and click. And then we're going to go on over to our terminal and SSH into that machine. All right, so here we are. We have SSH into this machine. It's basically just an Ubuntu box where we have the Avalanche Go full mode uh, running. And so there's a couple of things we can do here. First, I want to do a curl request to get the um, network name. You can see here on this curl request, it's to localhost. The port is 9650, and we're calling info.get network name, and it's going to return mainnet. So by default, it's going to sync the mainnet. There's also another endpoint you can call, which is get network ID. You could call either of these in theory to confirm that you're on the right network. Again, we're on localhost with port 9650, and we're calling info.get network ID and you can see the network ID is one. So here we know network ID is one and it's mainnet. So by default, it's syncing mainnet. For the sake of this demo, of course, we want to do testnet, which is Fuji, and the network ID is actually five. So to do that, I want to uh, edit slash Etsy slash avalanche go slash conf dot JSON. I'm using Vim, of course, because it's bundled with this Ubuntu instance and it's an easy way for me to edit this file. And so here, when I open this, you can see this last, this bottom line here, network ID is mainnet. We want to change this to Fuji. Save and close the file. And now what we want to do is we want to um, system control restart avalanche go. So we want to restart this service and it's going to be syncing on Oh, sorry about that. So system control restart avalanche go. Okay, cool. So now when we call this curl request, get network name, you can see now it's syncing the Fuji network. And then again, if we do the get network ID, it's now on network five. So mainnet is one, Fuji is five. And so now we are syncing on the test net. So that's good. So next thing we want to do is we want to see if the node has finished bootstrapping. So for that, we're going to call the info.isbootstrapped endpoint. And then for our params, we have a chain property where we're passing in the value P. So we're checking to see if the P chain has finished bootstrapping. And you can see here that it says false. So you need to wait for your node to finish bootstrapping before you complete the next steps. And I want to repeat that this is absolutely critical, and I cannot overstate this enough. You should not add a node as a validator before it has finished syncing. This is an easy way to mess up your subnet, and it could also impact your uptime, which would ultimately impact the rewards your node gets for validating. And... Um, Syncing the full history of, you know, the entire uh, primary subnet can take potentially multiple days because you're literally rebuilding the entire DB that's going to have every single block and every single vertex going all the way back to the Genesis block. Um, there is a, um, you can configure this using the state sync enabled and set it to true. So, for example, if you were to edit this file right here, which is an empty um it's on object, you can see the Etsy avalanche go slash C slash config.json file. If you were to uh, add state sync enabled equals true to this as a JSON object. So if you added this property here, oh, sorry. 
you were to add state sync enabled equals true or state sync enabled true to this uh, file, then it would actually um, only it's it's it only downloads the chain state from your peers up to the recent uh, block near the tip and then it proceeds with normal bootstrapping so this can decrease the total time needed to bootstrap the node significantly but again for the sake of this demo it's not necessarily needed the main takeaway here is that if you call info dot is bootstrapped and it returns false you do not want to continue you want to wait until that uh returns true it's very very critical okay so next we want to get the node id so again there's a curl request we're going to make here we're calling info.get node id this is the node id that we're going to be using for the rest of this demo obviously every single node is going to have a unique node id so you want to make sure and call info.get node id and get the node id of the node you just spin up and it will be useful in the next uh, part of the demo so next what we want to do is we want to jump on over to the avalanche web wallet so it's wallet.avox.network and i am going to use a mnemonic which i know is pre-funded mnemonic key phrase if you uh, do not have any avox you can go to faucet.avox.network and you can paste in your c chain address the way you would get that is here at the top right, you can see the XPNC. If you click on C, it'll give you this address. You can copy it right here. Make sure, of course, that you're connected to the Fuji network. That's critical. And then if you do not have any Avox, you can get this C address, copy it, and go on over to faucet.avox.network, and you can actually paste it in here and get a drip of two Avox. Um, I don't need that, of course, because I do have some testnet Avox here. So now to add a um, validator, what you want to do is you want to go to the Earn tab on the left, click on Add Validator, and then here's where you're going to need your node ID. So we jump back on over here. If you remember, I called the curl request of info.get node ID and it returns this node ID. So copy that, paste that in here. Regarding the staking end date, um, to stake, to validate on the Avalanche network, it has to be between two weeks and one year. By default, the web wallet sets you up for three weeks. Let's just go ahead and change that to 15 days and click OK. The staking amount, if you're trying to validate the uh, mainnet, it actually takes 2,000 AVOX. But for Fuji testnet, we only require one AVOX. So type in one there. The delegation fee, this is the amount that your node will be rewarded um, if if a person doesn't want to spin up their own node and be a validator, they can actually delegate some stake to your node and your node will actually do the validation for them. And then the reward you give to them minus whatever this percentage is. We're just going to go ahead and leave that at 2%. And then here, this is the address where after the 15 days, after the staking period ends, the rewards and the funds will go back to this address. You can see if I click P up here, um, this is the same address as we see here. So you can see it ends in NQSC. That's the same address here. So basically this is just saying after 15 days, these funds and the rewards are going to be sent to my PeeChain address. So now you review everything on the right, make sure it all looks good. It does. And hit again, uh, make sure everything looks good and hit submit. So now the transaction is being sent. And boom, once it's successful, you see your tokens are now locked to stake. You can see in the right-hand column, it'll, uh, a new transaction will get pushed to the top of the stack. If you click this little uh, magnifying glass here, it'll actually open a new tab. And you can see that it was successful. And our node ID, which we can confirm is the same node ID as we got over here, D8UQ. D8UQ is now being uh, a validator. So now let's get this node ID. I'm going to update a new curl request. This one is validators. So let me get this. So if we go over to our terminal and we open a new terminal, so not the one that we're SSH into, you can see this is the Ubuntu username. This is the EC2 instance. If we open up a new terminal, this is local on my uh, machine and I paste in this curl command, sorry. This is, now we're calling, um, 
not local host. So now we're calling api.avox-test.network. So this is the public JSON RPC API, which we make available to developers. And this is obviously avox-test. This is for the Fuji testnet. And now we're calling validators. This is the, um, the ID of the primary subnet. And then here we have an array of node IDs. I'm going to go ahead and set this node ID uh, to the one to our node ID and it will automatically filter the output by that and you can see that boom we now have our node ID as a pending validator and it stays in this state for five minutes and so there is a another uh, JSON RPC call which we will check out right here so this is platform dot get current validators And you can see that it returns an empty array. So for five minutes, it will be a pending validator. And then after that time is done, it will be a current validator and we'll be able to move on to the next step. So here's where we have to wait for five minutes. So I'm setting my timer on my phone so that I'll know when that's done. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get back started. It looks like it's already passed. So jumping back into this. Close that down. Okay, so after you wait five minutes, you can call get pending validators and you can see that it's now returning an empty array for validators and delegators. And if we call get current validators with the same format, so we have the subnet ID, which is the ID of the primary subnet, and then we're passing in our node ID as a string to this array for node IDs. And then you can see I'm actually piping it through JQ to get this pretty formatted JSON output. If we now call get current validators, you can see that our node ID, which is the same one we have here, is now a current validator. So our node ID is a validator on the Fuji testnet. So that's part one of our demo. We were able to spin up a node from AWS Marketplace. We were able to get the SSH address of it, uh, SSH into the EC2 instance, change it from syncing mainnet to Fuji, restart the box. Um, in theory, we would wait for it to sync, which could take multiple days. Then we would get the node ID and we uh, use the Avalanche web wallet to then um, go to the earn tab, add the node ID, and make it a, no, uh, a validator of the primary subnet for 15 days. And so again, after waiting five minutes, it's now a current uh, node validator. So the next thing we wanna do is we want to actually spin up a subnet we wanna create a subnet and deploy it to this EC2 instance, this validating node that we just spun up. And so to do that, we are going to be using Avalanche Cli. So Avalanche Cli is a command line tool that gives developers access to everything Avalanche. And um, this release specializes in helping developers develop and test subnets. And of course there is documentation available. And then we also have this out our uh, GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash ava-labs slash avalanche-cli, you'll see this page. It shows how to install and get it all set up, which I've already done, of course. And then we're also going to be using a ledger hardware wallet. So the industry standard for safely securing cryptocurrencies is hardware wallets. These are specialized devices that provide full isolation between your computer and your private keys. And I'm going to be using a Ledger Nano S. You can use Avalanche on a Ledger Nano S or a Nano X. And we also have um, steps for setting this up as well. which is here. We have steps that show exactly how to get your ledger set up um, and you can use it also with core wallet, etc. So now that we have this set up, we want to go on over to our terminal again. And we're going to be calling avalanche subnet create. We're going to call it demo subnet zero 
So it's going to ask us which VM we want to use. It bundles by default. You can use subnet EVM or spaces VM, or you can actually use a custom VM. For the sake of this demo, we're going to be using subnet EVM, which is a virtual machine that has 100% backwards compatibility with existing EVM developer tooling. So this is one of the ways Avalanche um, battles against the blockchain trilemma is that we scale horizontally. So if you have a DAP and it's incredibly popular and it's live on our CNET, um, or, or our C chain, you can launch your own subnet with an instance of subnet EVM and you can just deploy your DAP on there and then your app alone has to um, use the resources and the throughput and the finality of, of that subnet. And it's one of the ways that Avalanche is able to scale so amazingly. So here we're going to choose subnet EVM. We need a uh, chain ID. For the sake of this demo, it can really be anything. Um, there is a website that you can go out there and confirm that your chain ID is not conflicting with other existing chain IDs, but it doesn't really matter for this demo. So I'm just going to choose a random number. Our token, again, because this is a demo, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to call our token test, T-E-S-T. -E and then what version of subnet EVM would we like? Let's go ahead and use the latest version. It says, how would you like to set fees? So you can actually customize the fees on your own instance of the subnet, which is also amazingly powerful. For the sake of this demo, I'm just going to use the low disk use. And then you can also airdrop um, some of your token to a certain address. Uh, if you have a certain address you want to use, or you can actually use multiple addresses, you would use the second option here, customize your airdrop. But for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to use the top one. If you're doing a production deploy, so if you were deploying this to mainnet, you would not want to use this. Uh, option because there is a set of keys which we use for development. We call it the EWOC key. E-W-O-Q is the first four characters of the private key when it's CB58 encoded. Um, so you wouldn't want to airdrop your tokens to that key because anybody has access to it and they could in theory steal your tokens if you were doing this to the mainnet. But again, for the sake of this demo, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to do that. And what I like to add a custom pre-compile. Pre-compiles are the ways that you can actually add extended functionality to your instance of the EVM on Avalanche. It's incredibly powerful. We'll leave that for another demo. And for this, I'm just going to choose no. So there it is. It's successfully created a subnet configuration. If I say Avalanche subnet list, you can see we have one now, demo subnet zero. And if I say Avalanche subnet describe demo subnet zero, it will give us this great description of the subnet we just created. It's not deployed yet. We've only created the configuration. So it gives us the details, the name, the chain ID, the token name, the virtual machine ID, which is an instance of the subnet EVM. Down here, it gives us the gas config. So this is um, what we set up by default. And then it gives us, it shows that we're doing an airdrop. So these, this is the uh, C chain address, which maps to that Ewok private key, which I mentioned before. Again, for the sake of this demo, it doesn't really matter. But if you were deploying to mainnet and you airdropped to this address, anybody has access to that private key because we put it in our documentation. They would be able to go get those funds. So again, you don't want to airdrop to this address on production. And then we didn't do any pre-compiles. So that is the description of our uh, subnet. You can also pass in the genesis or just G for the shortened version, the Genesis flag. And it will give you a JSON object of the same information that was above, but this is if you wanna um, paste this JSON into a configuration file, this is basically how your uh, subnet is going to be set up and configured. And so now we want to do a subnet avalanche. Subnet deploy demo subnet zero. And so I'm going to demonstrate something here. So check this out. So now we're we're calling the avalanche subnet deploy, and we're passing in the subnet that we just created. We're going to deploy it to the Fuji network. Which key source should be used to issue the transaction? We're going to use Ledger. I got to unlock my ledger. Give me one moment. Okay. Running those commands again. So this is something. So how would you like to set your control keys? We're going to use the ledger address. 
And look, we got this error. So this is interesting. It's saying that your ledger does not have enough AVOX on this key. So I did this on purpose because I wanted to demonstrate something to you. So now let's jump on over to the web wallet and let's debug this. So if I go to the web wallet, I no longer need to access this pre-funded wallet. So I'm going to refresh the page. And now I want to access the wallet and I want to use a ledger. So you can see it does this derivation path because we support BIP44. So these are the derivation paths that we're going to use to derive the keys and the addresses. So this is on this ledger right now. Okay, so now here we are. It loaded this. You can see we're on the Fuji testnet. So far, so good. You can see that our P chain does, the P um, wallet does have enough AVOX, but it's complaining of an error and saying that we do not have enough AVOX. What's the problem there? So what you can, how you can debug this is if you go to the Manage Keys tab on the left, and over here you can see the HD Addresses button. Click this. And we'll open this um, little modal here that shows you the different addresses that are on your, uh, your ledger device. We want to go to platform. And then you can see that these are the different keys that have been derived. You we saw the derivation path when we first uh, accessed the web wallet via the ledger. And so these um, addresses have been derived. Each transaction, we generate a new address, which is per the BIP44 Bitcoin and crypto convention. And you can see that what it tried to do Whenever we uh, check this out, it tried to use this address to sign the transaction, but you can see this address doesn't have any AVOX. So what we would like to do is we would like it to use this address because this is the one that has the most AVOX. So what we can do there is there's actually a flag you can pass in. So if I come over here and I say, if I pass in the help flag to the subnet deploy command, we can see that there is a dash dash ledger dash adders flag that you can pass in. So now if I say avalanche subnet deploy demo subnet zero dash dash ledger dash adders. I want to pass in this. So again, what network are we deploying it to? We're deploying it to Fuji. And so now it's choosing a different address. You can see up here before it tried to use this one, DDRJG. Now it's using the correct one, 4X2, which is the one that has the funds. So that's correct. Um, it says, how would you like to say your control keys? Control keys are the keys which sign the transactions, which allow you to make additions such as adding a validator or launching a virtual machine onto a subnet. We want to use the ledger address. And so now it's saying, please sign subnet creation hash on the ledger device. So here on the actual ledger, I can see that it gave me a hash. And if I click over and hit approve, it's now signing this transaction with this device. And it's saying subnet has been created with ID, boom, now creating blockchain. Please sign blockchain creation hash on the ledger device. So the same thing. It's giving me a hash. I click over and hit approve. And now it's creating a blockchain and signing the transaction. So boom, that was successful. So we can now see deployment results. We got the chain name, the subnet ID, VM ID, blockchain ID, RPC URL, and the P chain transaction ID. So if we take this subnet ID and copy it and jump on over to a block explorer and paste this in, you can see that this is a create subnet transaction and it was successful. If we come down here and get the pchain transaction ID and go over to a blockchain explorer and paste it in, same thing, we have a create chain transaction. So here is a successful create subnet transaction and a successful create chain transaction. So the final step that we want to do is we want to actually add a validator. So we're going to say avalanche subnet add validator and we're going to pass in demo subnet zero because this is a subnet we want to add a validator to and then the same flag as before we're going to call the ledger adders flag and pass in the uh, the address on our ledger device which we know has the funds so we click that choose a network to add a validator to we of course want to use fuji and it's saying, what node ID would you like to whitelist? 
And so if we click back over here, if you remember, we called info.get node ID on our node and it gave us this node ID. So we're going to copy that and paste this. What weight would you like to assign the validator? We're going to go with default. When would you like it to start? When it started in one minute. And how long should it validate for? We're going to have it validate until the node stops validating the primary subnet, which if you remember was 15 days. And so now it's going to create a new transaction. It's going to have a sign it on the device. So please sign add validator hash on the ledger device. Same thing, it gives me a hash. I click approve. And there it is, transaction successful. So if I take this transaction ID and I go over to a block explorer, paste it in. we can see we have an add subnet validator transaction. So that was the second part of the demo. This showed that we are able to use Avalanche Cli and a Ledger hardware wallet, and we can create a subnet. We can launch an instance of a subnet EVM on that subnet, and then we can actually add subnet validators all using Avalanche Cli and a Ledger hardware wallet. So that was it. That was the demo showing how to spin up an Avalanche validator node from the AWS marketplace and make it a validator on the Fuji network. And then how to use uh, Avalanche Cli and a Ledger hardware wallet to create a subnet, deploy the subnet, launch an instance of subnet EVM virtual machine on it, and then add a node ID as a validator on the subnet. Hopefully that was helpful. If you guys want to follow up, please check out docs.avox.network to get uh, the full technical documentation. And you can communicate with our team by checking out our Discord server at chat.avox.network. Thank you so much. Cheers.